Shalom, you guys. Welcome back to the Code Searcher. Wanted to stir the interest a little bit. Got a uh, really interesting documentary I want to sit with you and share. Going to be commenting a few places in this. Please stay tuned for this. You don't want to miss it, especially if, we, if you have an interest in codes. This is really going to bless you to see this. Um, you, pray, you, you may have never seen it before, uh, but I'm going to play it on my channel and uh, hopefully stir some interest in these codes. Stay tuned for the, at the end of the video, we're going to talk a little bit about the class and uh, what we do have to offer here. So without further ado, let me share that with you and we'll watch it together here. Since ancient times, humankind has searched for a hidden meaning or message in one of its most mysterious texts, the Bible. From religious mystics who poured through the Old Testament to legendary scientist Isaac Newton, the search for secret messages would continue for hundreds of years until a mathematician using a computer claimed to have unlocked the code. Its messages of past events rocked the scientific world and began a controversial debate with critics that continues to this day. Proponents of the code continue their research with startling new future predictions, while its opponents continue to challenge their findings. If indeed the Bible is encoded with messages, what is it trying to tell us? Could these prophecies be utilized for the good of man, or is the code, as critics argue, little more than statistical coincidence? Proponents believe that the discovery of the Bible code has set mankind on a course that will forever change his fate. Does the code reveal that mankind has a bright future, or have we entered the beginning stages of the end of days? The Bible Code is both controversial and mystifying. For centuries, the five books of Moses, also known as the Old Testament, have been carefully examined by theologians, researchers, and mathematicians, all looking for an answer to life's great mysteries. They have searched for a hidden code that would provide us with these answers by outlining past and future events. Codes are, in a mystic sense, the intimate whisperings of the divine what this is suggesting is that there is a hidden text encoded in the Bible. The codes are like holy ink. Somebody sealed up this ink 3,000 years ago. We spill it on the table and it, sp it spells Bin Laden terror, terror attack. The Bible code is not there to be hidden, it's there to be revealed, but it's designed to be revealed through the appropriate technology, like computers. So there's something amazing going on here. The history of a prophetic code in the Old Testament dates back to the 16th century when religious mystics first began to search for biblical prophecies in its text. 300 years later, it consumed one of history's greatest scientists, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton spent most of his life doing something very similar to the Bible code. I mean, he, he, he tried to use the Bible in order to find uh, what will be in the future on one hand and how to make uh, gold out of, uh, of coal. But how exactly does the Bible code work? According to researchers, the Let code me just is say found this by searching for words and... About Isaac Newton, you guys. Um, we know from the Cambridge papers that he spent 75% of his time behind a locked door searching codes by hand. And as you heard the presenter saying there, he was looking for crazy things like the you know, able to to know the future, but also how to how to make gold, right? So imagine that the alchemists of that time were trying to make gold out of lead, right? He was trying to use the Bible to see if it was possible. So I've told my students this um, many times before. Isaac Newton spent so he he taught himself Hebrew to search these codes by hand. You now have access to technology he could not even imagine. So we can do in fractions of a second 
what would take him many, many days and hours and even years um, to search out, right? That's important. You have you have access to something that one of the greatest scientists in the world never had access to. Phrases in the text of the Old Testament through the use of a technique called equidistant letter sequencing, or ELS. And ELS, uh, colloquially just called the code, is the sequence of letters that you get when you... By the way, this guy here is Brendan McKay. Brendan McKay is a flaming flaming atheist he's a mathematician in australia but he has always since day one come against the codes and said that you could find codes in moby dick and going to win and even produce some codes the problem is the rabbis also text uh tested the very same text and could not reproduce the code so you're going to hear from him a couple times in this presentation but um needless to say he was debunked many years ago. This this um, particular documentary is from the early 2000s, so around 9-11. And so that's why you're going to see some of those codes in here. But at the time, this was the biggest um, critic of the Bible codes. But he pretty much destroyed his own reputation and his um, credibility when he faked the Moby Dick codes. Okay, so keep that in mind. Start with a particular letter of a text. Then you choose a particular number and you skip forward by that amount, repeatedly choosing letters as you go. In order to perform a search, the letters are arranged in a grid or matrix, making it easier to perform the search and allowing the results to be clearly shown. In this example, the word food is found at a skip of 10 forward, order at a skip of 10 forward, and roses at a skip of 11 backwards. According to code researchers, the closer these individual letters are to one another, the smaller the odds are of coincidence. So small, they say, that they cannot be mere chance. Two ELSs are like two people meeting on a street. And if you see your friend on the street from 20 years ago, you think it's amazing. One in a million. But there's wiggle room to the tune of one in a million because it could have been any of a hundred friends. It could have been any of... 10,000 days in your life. So it's it's really ordinary, even though it's surprising. The ultimate would be to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to see Joe Smith uh, at 10 o'clock at the corner of Elm and First Street. That would be one in a billion billion. Bible code research has its modern day origins in the tedious task of writing out the Old Testament on index cards and then manually counting out equidistant letter sequencing patterns in the hope of finding encoded messages. Shortly before World War II, an early code researcher named Chaim Ber Michael Dov Weismandel claimed to have found basic words hidden within the biblical text. But Weismandel's research was halted during the war. For decades, code research lay dormant. But in the 1990s, Lithuanian-born mathematician Eliyahu Rips took up where Weismandel left off. Rips and his team of researchers equipped with a computer programmed to search through massive amounts of text in seconds used Weismandel's basic theories to run advanced tests in the Old Testament. Using names, birth, and death dates of 32 famous rabbis, they ran test after test to see if these words and dates appeared in any cohesive fashion within the biblical text. According to Rips and his team, they discovered a highly accurate hidden code in the Old Testament that was comprised of words, phrases, and in some instances, complete sentences. Rip's experiment shocked the scientific world when it was published in a leading scientific journal, Statistical Science. The and by the way, these are the same rabbis that debunked uh, Brendan McKay. And all this work was, was produced in the Statistical Science magazine. So it, this is a science. This is a mathematics. The experiment was quickly embraced and attacked from both sides. For a while, I was being approached by people, codes were hot news in the Jewish community. What did I think about this? And I said, well, I hadn't looked, that the random codes were nonsense as far as I could tell, and that the other things I was very suspicious of. As soon as Rip's work was published, Harold Gans, a retired senior cryptologic mathematician and crypto analyst with the U.S. Department of Defense, heard about the controversy and was immediately skeptical that such a code existed. I said it's utter nonsense, and for about a year and a half I did nothing about it. 
A year and a half later, my wife heard about it, and she urged that I get involved. After all, I was an expert in codes. Look into it. I said, no, it's nonsense. Why should I waste my time with this? And she said, well, you're a mathematician, you're a code breaker. Why don't you prove that it's nonsense? Gans and his team conducted a rigorous series of tests called the City's Experiment. Well, the City's Experiment is one that was done not long after the Great Rabbi's Experiment. In fact, it involves the same Great Rabbis. The difference between the Rabbi's Experiment and the City's Experiment is that instead of using the dates of birth and death, they used the places of birth or death of the same rabbis. The city's experiment was originally designed to prove that the Bible code was nothing more than a statistical coincidence. But what Gans found was startling. So I set out to prove that it's nonsense, but in the end, I proved that it was real. We see more and more evidence of things that tell us that not only was it solid, but it was super solid. Skeptics compared the Bible code findings with the... Okay, so, so the how is this, you guys? Here. All right, Gans was a skeptic which is where I started when I started doing this. I was like, how is this even possible? Though I didn't believe it was impossible, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. Hero Gans, was a he's a religious Jew, an Orthodox Jew who, he didn't put two cents in it, right, you guys? So what did he do? He wrote his own code program and tested it. And lo and behold, he proved that it was right. But Brendan McKay, on the other hand, this flaming atheist, won't have any of it. Even went so far as to forge codes to prove that it didn't exist. And that, you know, implies that the man had an agenda. Now, I'm not saying that he did. I'm just saying that what the rabbis produced and what they discovered when they tested his codes out was that he was lying. Okay. So these very same rabbis were very skeptical in this whole thing until they started searching the codes themselves. Nostradamus. They argued that messages in the Bible code about both past and future events are as nebulous and open to interpretation as Nostradamus's works. Code researchers argue there is a distinct difference. What is the difference between the Bible code and Nostradamus? In fact, I think it's the other way around. Like, what do they have in common? The only thing they have in common, apparently, is that they both seem to predict the future. Nostradamus made a lot of predictions that were uh, very vague, and that were interpreted uh, in ways that fit cir certain uh, circumstances later on. The Nostradamus predictions are very unclear. No one really knows what they're, they're saying. As an example of the difference between the predictions of Nostradamus and the Bible Code, Code proponents point to one of Nostradamus's most well-known quatrains. Beasts, ferocious from hunger, will swim across rivers. The greater part of the region will be against the hister. The great one will cause it to be dragged in an iron cage when the German child will observe nothing. Some ascribe this to refer to Hitler and Germany during World War II. Was Nostradamus really referring to Hitler when he used the word hister? The truth as to what Nostradamus actually meant is relegated to the reader's interpretation of his words. In contrast, proponents claim Bible code findings are remarkably concise. Berlin, Nazi and enemy, Hitler, slaughter, oven, extermination, Auschwitz. This finding is even more chilling with the addition of the name Adolf Eichmann, Hitler's architect of the final solution. Nostradamus researchers point to yet another quatrain as evidence of his accuracy. From the sky will come the great king of terror. They argue that this quatrain refers to Osama bin Laden as the great king of terror, and that from the sky refers to the terrorist attacks of September 11th. In contrast, the Bible code references the September 11th attacks in the following matrix. Muslim airplane attack will crash the Twin Towers twice. In the specific references, proponents claim lies the difference. The fact is that the Bible code is completely scientific and mathematical. Nostradamus is simply subjective and it is ambiguous. Nostradamus created his own verses. All his prediction are his own codes. The Bible codes are divine. They were created by God. For Gans, the Bible code is distinguished from the prophecies of Nostradamus by the clarity of its messages and mathematical probability. Many people are fooled by Nostradamus. In fact, 
it's quite meaningless. On the other hand, the Bible code can be evaluated mathematically and scientifically. There's no subjectivity involved. There's no ambiguity involved. You calculate probabilities, it has mathematical accuracy, either it's valid or it's not valid. It's not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of fact. Not everyone would agree that the code is a matter of fact, but why does man want to know the future? If there is a Bible code, is it a doorway to messages about what may lie ahead, set to open at a certain time? If so, what messages are being sent? Throughout history, humankind has made numerous attempts to communicate with future generations. From burial rooms in the Great Pyramids to time capsules, even NASA sends messages about life on Earth into deep space. What motivates this need to make our mark varies, but what remains constant is the search for security in an uncertain world. Ironically, the answers we seek may be written in the past, encoded in the ancient biblical text that only now, through the advent of computers, some researchers say, may be revealed. Although code proponents agree that coded messages exist in the Bible, they disagree about whether they predict future events. Many argue that using the Bible code to foretell future events is a grave misuse of the code, while others believe that the argument is a moot point. I do have to say this, you guys. I don't condone trying to use the codes to predict the future. Now, let me just say this. Now, it may appear that I've tried to do that uh, in, in the past videos that I've done. It seemed predictive, but there's a difference, you guys, because I believe the connection between the ephod, which was a breastplate that the high priest wore in the Holy of Holies, standing before the Holy Flame, and the letters in, that were carved on each one of those stones would reflect onto the wall. When the high priest would ask the father a question, the answer would come in the shining of those stones. This was a direct, I mean, you could you could say that's divination, but in, in the sense of it is a function of the holy temple and of the breastplate of, of the ephod, I wouldn't call it that. And the reason I say that is because Daniel was classified. If you go read the book of Daniel, who was he classified with? He was grouped with the astrologers and the soothsayers and all the those that read the stars and did divination but was he a diviner he was the one that the king went to to get the answer why because of the anointing that's the difference you guys when you're in a divine communication with with shamayim with the heaven this is not divination if you're in a prayerful state searching codes and you ask the father a question and suddenly it comes to you and then you look it up in the code and there it is that's a divine connection there is a difference, you guys, but it can be people with the wrong intentions can use the codes to try to predict the future and they will fail miserably because it takes another component that you can't fake. And that's the Holy Spirit. Michael Drosden predicted the, the death of Yitzhak Rabin one year before it happened. And I believe the father did that to put this in the mainstream. This is how I found the codes. My stepfather gave me that book. I read it and was compelled to do this so, uh, years later. Michael Drazen never found another predictive code ever after that. The father only used him. And by the way, he was a skeptic. He was doing an expose for the Washington Post to prove the codes were wrong. And what happened? Abba used him to prove that they were right. But he only gave him one code that would stand alone above the others. That needs to be said. One thing that I think we can get from the codes is that the encoder knows the future. And the example of praying at, at the Western Wall so that the tragedy wouldn't happen, I think also shows that the encoder listens to us today. Even though we have both the future supposedly cast in stone, we also have free will and we also have the ability to connect to the encoder and to ask for his help if he knew about bin laden three thousand years ago he's a pretty powerful encoder let's talk for a second about the predictive element in codes why is there this great need to predict there's actually a great statement in the talmud that says that it's completely prohibited to engage in predictions of future 
And then on that same page in the Talmud, the rabbis then go in to a list of predictions of the future. So one sentence says, you can't predict, you're not supposed to predict, it's a violation of the religious spirit. And then on the same page of the Talmud, you have a list of all the predictions. And actually, this predictive notion exists throughout the centuries. Theoretically, it is conceivable that if the Bible code is solved, if it is actually deciphered in the cryptanalyst's sense, conceivably, one can predict the future. But of course, that would assume that the author of the Bible code wishes to allow us to predict the future. If he doesn't, it can clearly be designed so that that is not possible. We run into all kinds of problems trying to predict the future with the codes. First of all, we're not prophets, and uh, the prophets were unbelievable. The knowledge they had, the, the faith they had, we can't approach that today. Uh, maybe the code is a prophet of some kind, but we don't understand it yet. Bible code researcher Moshe Shek has found very personal revelations within the Bible which he has utilized to expand the scope and nature of his research. What really took me by surprise is the, the vast amount of information about myself that I saw in the codes. I look at the two critical terms, my month of birth and my name, and I found them in a very small proximity. In a very small window, I found many, many terms. And I saw in other places, all my uh, current relatives appear in the matrix. I found the names of the 11 generations unbelievable. The odds of 11 items coming at the right sequence are millions to one. There's a notion of great, beautiful, stunning text, ancient text, which says that Aaron is about to die. And Moses is talking to Aaron. And the way Moses comforts Aaron is that he tells Aaron that there's an illusion, there's a code to the story of your death in the Torah itself. And Aaron is comforted. Why did that comfort Aaron? A person can deal with any suffering as long as there's a why to the suffering, as long as it's part of a story, it's part of a weave, it's part of a fabric. And so it answers a deep human need to affirm the essential meaning structure of the cosmos. That's what codes do. Despite the debate over the ability of the Bible code to predict future events, code researchers point to its remarkable accuracy in outlining events in history as proof of its existence. According to code proponents who claim to have deciphered prophecies in the Old Testament, its messages are both fascinating and frightening. Franklin D. Roosevelt's declaration of war on Japan in World War II can be found in the code matrix, Roosevelt, President. He gave the order to strike on the day of the great defeat. Germany and Japan's fate is found in the matrix Axis powers, alliance of evil, 5705, and they did not prevail. One of the most defining and tragic moments in Egypt's history and a devastating blow to peace in the Middle East is highlighted with a matrix that includes the exact date of Anwar Sadat's assassination and the name of his murderer. A prince will be shot. A parade. 1981. Murdered. Sadat. Eighth of Tishri. A conspiracy. Khalid. Even the troubles of U.S. presidents surface in the code. President Nixon's downfall can be found in the matrix Watergate. Who is he? President, but he will be kicked out. The travails of President William Jefferson Clinton can be found in three distinct matrixes. Clinton, President. Clinton, Impeachment. Hidden Secret, Lover of Maidservant. And Clinton, Nation Against Impeachment. But if the Old Testament is encoded with messages, the logical question is, who encoded it and why? Was the Bible encoded by God for deciphering today? Was it encoded by some other supernatural force? Or are the findings of the Bible code nothing more than a statistical anomaly? A coincidence that could appear in any book of similar length to the Bible, as opponents suggest. They point to the recent tests in which codes about the assassinations of Indira Gandhi, 
JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. have been found in Moby Dick. Brendan McKay of the Australian National University is one of the world's leading opponents of the Bible Code. Well, of course, some people have devoted their life to this particular subject. They're not exactly going to give up and go home. And many people, of course, are not really interested in the scientific aspect of the Bible Code. They are simply subjectively impressed, and I don't have any problems with people who want to look at these things and imagine that there are messages in there. The only problem I have is when they claim that this is something which is scientifically rigorous, because in fact it isn't. We've studied the scientific evidence very, very carefully, and we've concluded that it's quite defective. One of the things that Brendan did is they found a list of spellings of the rabbi's names that enabled them to discover a similarly large probability for this combination in the Hebrew translation of War and Peace. For me, it's just like looking up into the sky and seeing a cloud that looks like an elephant or something. Maybe some people believe that there's some mystical meaning behind that. I don't mind if they do. Most people would agree that it's just an accident, and that's what the Bible codes are, just an accident. There are very brilliant people on both sides of the controversy about the codes, equally qualified. I do have a response to Brendan McKay and his work. Uh, I have a paper, a 64-page paper, which addresses all of the scientific issues that Brendan McKay raises, and it can be found on the World Wide Web and downloaded from the Internet. I challenge Brendan McKay to follow my procedures, my methodology, and come up with anywhere near what I have done, he will not be able to. Another question that causes great debate among code researchers is who actually encoded the Bible. Barry Rothman, code researcher and a lieutenant in the United States Coast Guard and formerly of the U.S. Navy, has a theory as to its origin. Uh, there are three ways that the codes could have come into being if uh, they're real. Uh, I personally uh, have seen enough personal material about enough people to believe that the codes are really from God. But the second possibility is that the codes were in fact produced by a human being in our future. Uh, or there may be some means of time travel where somebody sent at least a signal into the past. And then there's also the possibility of uh, alien intervention, that they, they could have uh, seen the future and, and uh, managed to warp into the past, or do, in some ways get into the past, and bring the message back to uh, a previous time. Now, the Bible, is the best seller, the world best seller of all time. There's no other book that's ever sold as much as the Bible. It would seem to me to be a very important question to know who wrote this popular book. It might also be very important to know who it is that's telling us not to kill, not to steal. Is it simply another person? Or is it a supernatural being who's telling you, listen, if you know what's good for you, you better not kill people. Some skeptics argue that the Bible is not the actual word of God, but rather transcribed by man over generations. If God had intended for messages to be encoded in the Bible, they reason, the code would not withstand the changes in text throughout the centuries. The author of the code, which is the author of the Bible, is himself a supernatural being, a being which is not bound by the laws of our universe. Most people would call a supernatural being God. This is a scientific conclusion based on pure physics and logic. If the Bible code exists, is it the word of God, a sign from the future, or is it just wishful thinking? One of the many questions that still remain is perhaps the most compelling. If the Bible is encoded, what message is being communicated and for what purpose? On a practical level, I, I see the codes as maybe helping people look at the original Torah a little bit more and maybe learning um, the Ten Commandments. What prophecy always did was say, pay attention, wake up, right? Realize that actually it's not going to go on like this forever, that actually things are happening, that actually if you wake up, if you're awake and not asleep, you can participate in shaping the destiny of the earth. All these things may be only preliminary to something better, bigger, and exciting yet to come. Today, code statisticians believe that the codes discovered so far just scratch the surface. 
If researchers are successful in deciphering the code completely, what might they find, and how might it be used? As a powerful tool to communicate the roadmap to our desired future, could the code prove the existence of the divine or supernatural, or warn us of impending tragedy? Kennedy assassinations. If there is a Bible code, could it have prevented these catastrophic events? Most experts disagree, but proponents have approached military and government intelligence organizations about the Bible code as a tool of prevention. If it does exist, could the Bible code be used as a tool for protection from evil? There is a possibility in the future of governments or government agencies using the Bible code in their work just like any technology, it starts out at a lower level and develops. And as it gets more developed, it gets easier to do. Now, of course, I worked for an intelligence organization for 28 years. Uh, you might think that they might be interested in this. But of course, since the Bible Code cannot really and accurately in any way predict the future, I doubt very much it would really be of interest to an intelligence organization. On an unofficial basis, I have uh alerted uh, certain superior officers to some things that I found in the codes that I found troubling. But uh, those predictions uh, may still lie off in the future in terms of their, the outcome because I found uh, places that would be attacked, I found means of attack, but I didn't find the date of attack. And so we don't know how long we're waiting uh, to see whether or not the material is good. Just a caveat into this, um, after the, the assassination of, of Yitzhak Rabin, Mossad began to use the Bible codes with a supercomputer to try to predict um, these events. And that, uh, of course, would be an algorithm called Monte Carlo, which searches for every possibility at a at a speed of light. So um, <clears throat> this sparked an interesting conversation I had recently about the possibility of AI assisting man in searching these codes. And of course, it would be a Monte Carlo type algorithm um that's very fascinating to me because i believe if everything is that was is and will be is in there we're we're somehow only hindered by what we know right we don't know the future how would we know how to look for something that we don't know but if and if an ai assisted by a human could search all possibilities and get probabilities for each one of those. It reminds me of a TV show that used to be on CBS years ago called Numbers. And a savant uh, that had a brother that was a um, an investigator he was working with his brother to solve crimes, and he was doing it mathematically on probabilities. And, it, you know, it's basically the same thing. Uh, what are the possibilities? And in that show, they were able to predict when a crime was going to happen. It was very fascinating. So I do think it is possible to know things, especially if we have a connection to um, the father and he's inspiring us and telling us what to look for. Right. But anything short of that, I think, would be a failure. And of course, Michael Drazen had a lot of failed predictions, which actually did damage to the, the whole field as as a whole, uh, because people the first thing they would say was you can't predict the future. Well, that's not the fundamental purpose, I believe, for the codes. I, a, I believe the the reason why they're there is to because the Bible interprets itself. But on top of that, everything that was, is, and will be is also there. And it's multifaceted. So let's continue. The former head of research and development of Israel's Ministry of Defense, General Isaac Ben Israel, was involved in one of the code's most startling findings when he was approached in September 1995 by journalist Michael Drosnin with a frightening Bible code prediction. The assassination of then Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. I first met Mr. Michael Drosnin in 1995, uh, and he came to my office uh, claiming that he has a method to predict the future based on the Bible. And he told me that uh, Prime Minister Rabin is going to be assassinated in the next year. On November 4th, 1995, two months after General Ben Israel was approached, 
Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated during a rally in Tel Aviv. And he came back uh, the, the next week. Toby, you see, uh, it works. Maybe he knew something not... He didn't take it from the Bible. Maybe he knew something. And it, this was his way of telling me uh, about it. I mean, trying to warn me that Rabin is going to be assassinated or something like this without telling me the real source and telling me a story about the Bible. From time to time, he continued to come to Israel and give me more predictions. Some of them came true. Uh, some of them were wrong. But he predicted, for example, that uh, uh, Ehud Barak will be elected to the prime minister long ago before Ehud Barak was even a candidate. General Ben Israel does not believe in the existence of a Bible code. During the remainder of his service for Israel's Ministry of Defense, however, he continued to consider Bible code predictions as one of many possible but not probable sources of intelligence. I couldn't ignore some of the predictions that he gave before things happened. Sometimes you don't know uh, what is the source for the, for the report, but you take it seriously enough at least to be checked. Uh, and that's what we did with his uh, reports. Bible code proponents also assert that codes were used to assist Israeli intelligence in the 1991 Gulf War. Dr. Eliyahu Rips in Israel, prior to war in Iraq, looked for possible dates that missile, Scud missile, could be fired from Iraq into Israel. And they came up with a certain number of dates, and the stories are that they passed so that, these that's, to the Israeli... That's exactly what I just told you. Mossad or the intelligent agency used these codes, well, to know what was going to happen. And I guarantee you that Americans, uh, the American um, NSA, CIA people are probably doing the same thing with, with um, supercomputers. That's a fact, you guys. The intelligence agencies who use this information and also use it to brief the prime minister. We did, never took them as a very serious and concrete uh, source for predicting future. The Bible Code, if effective, would be a useful tool to warn against impending tragedy. But then again, could the code fall into the wrong hands? Is there a dark side to the code? It's like anything. It's how you use it. Are codes by themselves good or evil? They're neither. Let's assume codes work to some degree. What codes are is what I do with them. Anything that misleads the public into believing that something is true which is not, or something is not true which is, is of course wrong. And of course, there are people who love to sell programs because it's a good, there's a lot of money to be made in this subject, at least for the proponents. Every good thing has its shadow. Codes has a shadow. And so the shadow of the eros of codes is manipulation, is distortion is marketing tools, right, is the kind of reduction of this gorgeous notion that you've got this layered world of intimate relationship and these kind of, you know, flirting signals between God and humanity, right, that becomes, right, a marketing tool for a particular group of people in order to, right, move forward their particular understanding and their particular agenda. One so codes can be used for darkness, you guys, but you're not going to get that here. I have a high standard and a very high respect for what this is. This is very akin to the sons of Aaron bringing strange fire and they were, they dropped dead. So utmost respect for the creator and what this is, is needed to be a good code searcher. But as they said, there are many out there that would try to manipulate that tried to use an agenda to prove that something one way or another. And I've always said and always told my students, you have to, to be a good code searcher, you have to be outside the box. For instance, if you're a believer in the rapture and you want to see that what you believe is true and you will not budge. In other words, if you find something that's contrary to what you believe, will you ignore it? Or will you just push it aside until you find what you want to see? That's manipulation. We don't do that. It is what it is. And, it, and for many of you, you know, I had to move off of many doctoral beliefs 
because the co the Bible interprets itself. And when you're searching something out and it clearly shows you one thing and you continue to do another, you're deceiving yourself. That's why I say you have to be outside of the box and willing to be wrong. Right? One of the more fascinating areas of current code research takes the topic from predicting the future to searching for one of the most sacred religious artifacts in history. The search for the Ark of the Lost Covenant has been the subject of speculation for many years. Does it exist? If so, can it be found? Lieutenant Rothman. So, uh, Barry Rothman, as you see here in, in the picture, is, is basically the Indiana Jones of code searching. Okay, as you see his hat there, he's he has a, an interest in archaeology and in particular um, finding proof uh, of where the the Ark of the Covenant is. And you know, of course, many of you are familiar with Ron Wyatt and his research. Barry Rothman is is along the same lines. He was trying to use numbers and some of the the, the calculations that he was finding in the codes to find a grid of the possibility of the location. So, I mean, that's a really interesting way to use the codes as an archaeological archaeological tool to solve a problem right so that's very interesting to me and we will be looking at his website which is i believe artcode.org that's barry rothman's site he's got amazing codes over there you guys he's very good at what he does and uh, i think it's a very novel idea to try to use it in archaeology right just to prove or disprove some of um um what we believe today in, in sciences. And is highly experienced with maps and charting courses for both the U.S. Navy and the Coast Guard. With the help of the Bible Code, he hopes to solve one of mankind's greatest mysteries, to retrieve the lost Ark of the Covenant. To say that you've got a, a code, a computer-compatible code, that's inserted in the Torah, uh, in the first five books of the Bible that were written uh, 3, 000, over 3,000 years ago, you have to have extraordinary proof. To me, the proof would be to find the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what was the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark was a gold box. It measured two and a half cubits by one and a half by one and a half cubits. And uh, in it, uh, God told Moses, that so we read in the Bible, to put the Ten Commandments. In October of 1997, Rothman ran a computer search for the lost relic. He typed in the words, Ark of the Covenant in Hebrew. The program scanned through the Old Testament and came up with one result. The number one popped up, and it meant there was an encoding of the Ark. But what did it mean? It might be there by chance. And when I noticed where the Ark came together with buried in Egypt, uh, Numbers 33-4 suddenly had a revelation. I'm a Coast Guard officer, and I think coordinates all the time. And when I saw 33-4, I said, you know, that looks like a longitude that's in the Middle East, somewhere in that area. And lo and behold, that position I saw on that first night remains the position that the codes have over and over again led me to. And it's not just any position. It's the position where the scholars believe Moses split the sea. As for what I expect to find when I get to the coordinates at 31 degrees, 9 minutes north, 33 degrees, 4 minutes east, the first possibility uh, would be nothing but sand. And if that's the case, that's fine, because if uh, all we do is prove that the codes are false, then we, as I said before, we don't have uh, another set of uh, fortune cookies or horoscopes to worry about. Uh, the second possibility is that I will find the Ark of the Covenant there, and uh, who knows, angels or whatever, and the Messianic Age begins. Some code researchers believe that the code could be used to warn us of impending natural disasters or lead us to new discoveries in science and medicine. I think that when we use the codes to maybe predict a possible disaster or problem and we can do it without alarming the world because we're going to be wrong most of the time then maybe it's okay i don't know i don't know i still have the hope as a, a coast guard officer that uh, there is some way that we can predict where a hurricane or a, a tsunami is going to hit or a, uh, some way to know when an earthquake is going to occur so we can mitigate the effects of uh, any natural disasters like that. I think if we develop it enough so and we come up with repeatable results that are not difficult to find, that are usable information, then of course countries would use it. Code could offer a way to protect our planet from something like an inbound asteroid. Again, it would be very nice to know when and where these things are coming from if that's encoded. 
Uh, there may be cures to diseases in there. All these things are possibilities. But what has the Bible Code said about recent events in world history? And what predictions has it made about our future? If the code is real, does it allow for free will? Or does it dictate a path towards the end of days? You know, he just said something about free will. Um, and you guys, there needs to be something said about that. We all have choices. So that is an X variable that's in this that's unpredictable, so to speak, right? We can't know what um, people are going to choose. We can see what is my, most likely probable, right? For instance, um, people had a choice in the elections. Uh, you, you saw what happened in, in, in the past several elections where we were very accurate on that. And it was based on probabilities, you guys. It wasn't predicting in the sense that um, we're trying to be a prophet here. I've never claimed to be a prophet, only a Bible code analyst um, that may have, you know, been given something prof prophetic, but it, it has nothing to do um, with me, right? So that needs to be set. Um, let's continue. We're going to talk more after this. Despite the code's seemingly accurate prophecies, critics warn that the words and phrases found in the Bible are simply statistical anomalies, chance occurrences that were not woven into the Old Testament by design. But the tragic events of September 11th marked another chapter in the ongoing debate over the code's validity. As proponents claim, the day is recounted in a series of hauntingly accurate code matrices. It starts with two words, Migdale Hata'omim, the Twin Towers. The probability of their being as encoded as close as they are is 1 in 200. This was discovered by Professor Eliyahu Rips. However, another codes researcher, Yecheskel Zilber, did a remarkable experiment. He took many verbs associated with the nefarious events of 9-11. For example, to murder, to hijack, to crash, to destroy, to burn, to melt. He put all these verbs into the present tense. And he looked for the proximity of all of these verbs to that central Migdalei HaTaomim, the Twin Towers. He obtained a probability of 1 in 20,000. If you put it in the past tense, you get nothing. If you put it in the future tense, you get nothing. One matrix located within the book of Genesis is particularly compelling. Twin Towers, Bin Laden, terror incident. I will give you the nickname, destruction. Cursed is Bin Laden. Revenge belongs to the Messiah. Which is describing the event. Do you guys, did you, see, did you happen to see how long that code table is that runs down the center? A lot of information. And by the way, the day of this event, there were four independent code researchers, uh, G, uh, Jewish rabbis, who looked the event up and found the same codes independent of one another. That's amazing to me. Same codes, which has happened with me and Laderson and other code researchers. We'd find the same codes independent of one another of 9-11 in intimate detail with all the things that happened on that day and it's written in the present tense because the author is not bound by time he does not have a past a future and a present as we do to him everything is seen in the present the code for the twin towers has twin towers with bin laden and with with terror incident and so we have terror incident and and bin Laden coming right from the headlines. It turned out that it contains much more than we previously thought. So all this actually give us one meaningful sentence. Muslim airplane attack will crash the Twin Towers twice. This new level of Bible codes development using phrases and sentences is going to be the exact method that will convince all the skeptics that the Bible code is, in fact, true. So the chances that they will group so tightly in one small part of the text turn out to be much less than one to a million. We have codes that are complete sentences in one line. So all of the spatial considerations 
don't matter anymore. You have one line. And then it together gives a kind of a graphical picture of it. So there was the tower, now it fell upon its face. So this is a standing tower, then how it fell down. The code matrixes of September 11th extend beyond the collapse of the World Trade Center towers. The Pentagon attack is also found in the code matrixes. Pentagon, plane crash, secondary target, and Pentagon, damaged, emergency from Arabia. Now, to have all of this in one sentence grammatically correct is phenomenal. The code for the, the Twin Towers was actually found, I think, by uh, four people uh, just within the, the few hours after it happened. If code research is to be believed, events reverberating from the 9-11 disaster also exist in the Bible. The current Iraq War and Saddam Hussein are mentioned in the code passages. Saddam Hussein, 2003. Who will be destroyed? And Saddam has been captured, has been humiliated, and they hated him. Some believe there are clues about the location of weapons of mass destruction in a code matrix which contains complete phrases with the keywords chemical weapons and Becca, Damascus, which could be interpreted to mean that the much sought after weapons of mass destruction may have been sent from Iraq through Damascus, Syria to the Becca Valley in Lebanon. Roy Reinhold is one of the code's leading proponents. In this demonstration, he shows how code findings are digitally calculated. It's not very difficult. First, I start the program. Then the next step is I load the search text, which is a tour of the first five books of the Bible. The main term that I'm looking for in this matrix is biologicals. And then other terms I use to find the exact matrix. I want to look for Syria, Damascus, Bekaa Valley, Lebanon, I want to find a matrix that has biologicals in it and chemicals, which would be another term, and then find these geographic areas so that I know I'm on the right matrix um, that I can develop further. The code also reveals a matrix concerning the event that stunned the Washington, D.C. area in 2002, the Beltway sniper case. John Lee killed. Days of fear from that upon his left hand. Washington and with his right finger. I started by looking at the word Washington and write part of the word Washington. Sharing letter is seven days of fear. Very close to it, I saw the word terror. Blood is terror. Bad situation. It says there on your left hand with the right finger. As soon as I typed in the name Malvern Muhammad, two months before they proved it, I said to my friends, Malvo has blood on his hands. That was incredible. Two months. Of all the code. Two months before they proved it, Moshi Shock had found the name Malvo and Muhammad and knew that Malvo was the trigger man. Matrixes found by the Bible code, there is one recurring theme present. Man is on the road to the end of days. Recent news broadcasts have reported of an asteroid that might be on a collision course with Earth. The code seems to suggest that man's end may come in the form of a comet hitting the Earth in the year 2012. Comet 5772, Earth annihilated. But another code matrix seems to suggest a different outcome, that the comet may be destroyed before it reaches Earth. Comet, it will be crumbled. I will tear to pieces. Now, this was really interesting to me because I worked this code, you guys. I'm very familiar with this one. And at the time, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was common Elenin. Remember the, the hammer of God, right? Uh, or one of those comets around that time that made it was coming close to the earth and it was going around the sun, but it got pulled apart. It got ripped to pieces. Right. We did find that in the code. It, it's 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 right there in the plain text. I will tear into pieces. Um, 
And that's that's what happened. So, but it also said annihilation. Now, could this this was there a choice here? Um, it, we could have gone either way. All possibilities are there. It's a matter of probability, which is more probable. Okay. So this was a conundrum of, of, of mine when I was looking at this, and I was convinced we were going to see something catastrophic. Same thing with Comet Siding Spring, with the close approach to Mars. And I was looking for, even though the code said collides, I was looking for telling people there was going to be a deep impact. Of course, I was incorrect about that, but the code was always right. Always right. It was later determined, a year later, that the comet did collide with Mars. And this is why Mars lit up like a light bulb. It was a static charge. It was plasma exchange that happened. Okay. So there's been some refining in understanding these codes and how to interpret them. It's best to let the code speak for itself. And then in hindsight, we can talk about the accuracy of that. Um, uh, you know, during the election of Donald Trump and, and Biden, the reason why I was so accurate on that, I was looking at that code for 11 months. And it looked to me like Biden was going to be president. And at the beginning of that code search, I was probably in the range of, you know, 20 to 30 percent probable that Biden was going to be president. But as we got closer to the day, I was able to determine that it was a certain it was a certainty. OK, so the probability changed on that based on all the information, the, the Kamala code, all of that thing, all of that that came out changed my interpretation of what I was seeing. And it turns out I was correct. If you recall, and I did have to erase all of those videos because I started getting ding on misinformation, talking about stealing elections and things like that. You guys, for the solid week of the election week, if you remember, I did a broadcast every night, a live stream every night, all the way up to the election night and told you the same thing. Donald Trump was not going to be reelected. And I was right about it. Somebody testify in, in the chat down below so that everybody knows that I'm not just pulling your leg. I was spot on about that. How? How was I spot on? I've refined my understanding and knowledge of, of searching these codes. And, and it's called tenure. It's called experience, you guys. And it has nothing to do with being prophetic. I've never claimed to be a prophet, just a good analyst. 2012. When we look in the Bible, there are Bible prophecies that predict in the end of days something like that will happen. And I think that's what most people, uh, where this idea comes from in looking at a possible. And this is story. this was why I was looking for it because of, of Revelation 8 and Wormwood, Isaiah 24, and several other prophecies in the Bible that seem to indicate all pointing to an event called the great and terrible day that something like this is going to happen there are going to be things that are going to impact the earth um and it gives even the size of the objects you know the 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 the, the, the weight of a talent which i think is like 150 pounds or something like that these are stones falling from the sky flaming stones stones of fire why is this that sounds to me like some kind of catastrophic catastrophic event a comet um whatever plasma discharge i don't know it's only speculation at this point we can only go by the text and what we see in the code and make it a calculated um an uh, analysis of it and um you know this is why he's saying that is because of all the prophecies in the bible that indicate this this is going to happen um, a meteoroid strike of the earth the prophecy also seems to suggest that the end of days may have already begun with the September 11th attacks, twin towers in the end of days, which will bring about the beginning of the end of the world, world war in the end of days, and atomic holocaust in the end of days. As far as whether or not the code reveals all codes, the end time, all codes that you've seen here. Oh, every single one of those you just saw in there, we've worked on this channel, and, and I, I come to the same conclusion. We are in that time, you guys, and it's broken down into different sections. you got what's called the time of sorrows, the birth pains of the woman in travail. You've got Jacob's trouble, and it's a progression as we go. If you, if you want my opinion, I believe, honestly, 
that the, the end of days, the last days, has not been the last 20 years. It has not been the last 40 years. Has it been the last two years? It's actually been the last 100 years. And I know that because of what Daniel says, that in the time of the end, knowledge would be increased. Man would run to and fro across the, the face of the planet. That really didn't happen until about 100 years ago. More than that, a hundred, more than 100 years ago, the average person hardly traveled at all. They didn't go anywhere. Most people never left the county or the town that they were born in. They just didn't travel. You, they, it's it's not a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy until automobiles came along, airplanes, trains, boats, uh, or ships that that went across the Atlantic, and even still, um, that's that's not where we are today. A hundred years ago, you could have got on the Queen Mary, and it would have taken you several weeks to go to Europe. But now you can do that in several hours. And there are people that are flying and moving across the face of the earth right now in a constant motion that never stops. Right. That's the fulfillment of Daniel. So the Industrial Revolution to the time that we're in now. And if you really want to know the timing that we're in now, if this was a basketball game, I would say it's more relative to the two minute warning in a basketball game. It's the end of the end. And this is when we're going to see the travail of the woman in birth, in a birth pains are more frequent. OK, so that's where we are. Sometimes the answer is yes. We are, according to the codes, very clearly. There's, there's one a profound matrix I've seen that has in Hebrew, Ba'acharit Hayamin, which means in the end of days in the open text, vertical encoded uh, space right next to it, you have Ketz Hayamin, which is Aramaic for the end of days. And touching the first saying, end of days, is Arafat at skip one. And running into the other one at skip minus one is Ehud Barak. And so that, to me, places the end times as these times. It is important to note that despite these messages of doom, the majority of code researchers believe that humankind's fate is still within our control and the Bible code is merely providing one of an infinite number of outcomes. Just because the author knows what we are going to do in advance does not in any way bind us to do it. We make the choices. But the author, not being bound by time, can look into the future, so to speak, and see what choices we have made and therefore encode mind it in bending. the Bible. This is mind-bending to try to wrap your head around. I get it. So you're telling me that there's a creator outside of time and space that knows everything that's going to happen from beginning to end and from the end to the beginning, just like his word says. And he knows all the choices that you're going to make, right? This is why we see the choices and the possibilities that, that appear as probabilities that come up in these codes. He is the only one that knows which choice is going to be made. I can't determine that. I can tell you, you know, the handful of choices. For instance, in any in given election, you're only going to have a handful of people running, right? So you got a, a limited number of in your pool of search terms. So we can look at Nikki Haley. All of them. We can look at every single one of them and determine by looking at each one of them with, you know, just some discernment, who is more probable in being president. And so when it comes down to two, Trump or Biden, who is more probable, and then we see all the other added details that are in there. The shenanigans, that's, I got to be really careful what I say. The shenanigans that took place and all that, we can see that. And so now it comes more probable that he's going to be president and the orange one is not going to be president, right? It's as easy as that. I don't mean to make light of it, but that's essentially what it comes down to. Looking at what's probable and what's not. Okay, that's that's why this is mathematical. This this is about statistics and anomalies that that and X factors and variables that seem to point us in a direction. And so you can accurately determine. And again, I believe this this is comes with the gift of discernment, which is a one of the, the gifts of the spirit, right? To determine what is more probable. It's amazing. I'm hoping I'm stirring something in you and to, to check this thing out. Okay. Especially if you're, if you're mathematical and scientific minded, or maybe even atheist and you're, you, you're just like, that's oh, a bunch of hogwash. I would encourage you come join us in the class.
Test it for yourself. And that's where I started. I didn't just immediately jump on YouTube when I started doing this. I was trying to figure out if it was really true. Looking for things like the two witnesses and, uh, you know, uh, things from the Bible, like Isaiah 53, one of my most favorite codes. And 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 the fact that Yaakov Ramsel found that by hand, and I could find it very quickly, but with a computer, just did something to me. It put a drive and a passion in me that, that this is why I'm here today. And it all started with my stepfather giving me the book, uh, Michael Drosden's book, uh, Bible Code. That's where it all started for me. So I'm very thankful and I'm very passionate about this 15 years later uh, that I've been I've been on YouTube doing this. And I'm excited that uh, people are interested in, in, in wanting to learn some Hebrew and to do this because I think it will edify you. I think it'll bring you to a place where it solidifies your faith, especially if you're wavering or if you're not sure about yourself, because everyone thinks that God somehow forgets us and doesn't know who we are. No, he has a plan for you. He has a purpose for your life. Every single one of us are encoded in, in this text. And, and many are just amazingly unique. And I say that with a lot of conviction and a lot of passion because this is one of the first things I'm going to teach you guys in the class how to do is search for your own name. No one knows you better than you, only the father, right? So once you get into that mode of searching and seeing all those details, I'm certain that it's going to, to do something to you in your spirit that's going to motivate you to want to really do this even further um, and use you in some way. I love to see some former students that I had and Scott, and several others, Martin, um, doing their own thing um, and, and finding amazing codes. There's nothing that ever indicated to me that I was the only one going to be doing this, this, this great code search or something like that. It's not like that, you guys. I love to share this with you, and I like to see other people thrive and do good things in this. It, that gives me so much pleasure. It's not about me, okay? And that's not why I'm doing this school. This is not, you know, Jonathan's school uh code searchers right this is the father's codes i'm just a servant just someone that that he chose to to put this in and it, it was the most random way that he did it with my stepfather handed me a book many years ago in the early 90s okay so i'm hoping this this uh bible code documentary kind of stirs something i'm going to post a couple more videos in the next few days that are just some of my favorites. Matter of fact, I was watching all these videos when I was just getting started on YouTube and doing doing my thing on YouTube. This was what was driving me, some of this, right? And so I'm praying that this is going to do the same thing for you. Let's talk in just, a, we're going to wrap this up. It's not much long, maybe two or three minutes. We're going to finish that and then we're going to talk a little more about the class, okay? Are still ours. Maybe the, the codes are trying to just help us become more receptive as, as a global community and maybe slowly that will happen whatever one believes with respect to the bible code one thing is clear we still have time to create our own fate before we are destined to become history Isn't that amazing? I've got a couple more for you. Uh, I got a Chuck Missler um, presentation. If you don't, guys don't know who Chuck Missler is, he, he used, used to be here with us. He passed away in uh, 2018. Um, an amazing Bible scholar and um, just very knowledgeable of Bible prophecy, but he had a particular love for the Bible codes. He was one of my friends. I met him like five times at different conferences that I went to um, and spent many hours sitting down talking with him. And uh, I was fascinated with his level of knowledge. And so it was, it was a pleasure to be able to share some of the codes I had found with him. Right. Um, just an amazing person. So that's coming up in the next few days. I'm going to upload that one. And then there's one more um, Bible code um, documentary type uh, expose type 
uh, video that I found that I want to, you know, present. Not many views on it on on the place that I found it. So that's kind of sad. Um, I, I really want to see this field grow, and and more people come into the knowledge of uh, what what this is all about. It's blessed me, you guys. It's blessed me tremendous in my life. It's given me purpose um, to do this, and I'm hoping that will inspire you guys as well that that are wanting to do this. We're doing this now at an all time low cost. Uh, this is not the same price that I had two years ago when we, we had the, the 72 modules that you guys had to work through. Uh, by the way, I had like an 80% turnover rate at that point, which was very frustrating, very frustrating because my harsh desire is to teach you guys. And so I want to have a class that uh, people are, who are engaged and they really are wanting to do this. And I kept losing students, you guys, two or three a month. The, the turnover rate was insane. And most of them said uh, one of the reasons why they dropped out of the course was because of the modules. And uh, the other reason I'm not even going to talk about that, that, that has to do with a person. OK, so modules gone. We're not doing that anymore. The very first thing we're going to do is learn some letters. It's just 22 of them. And then uh, we're going to be every week that we meet, we'll, we'll have 10 vocabulary words that, that I'll give you to learn. And we'll be going over that together and learning that. We'll be watching uh, different presentations on codes. We'll be looking at code uh, functions uh, in, in the code program, going over that so you'll be familiar with it. And, and it'll basically be uh, me taking the training wheels off of the bicycle, so to speak, and turning you loose, right? So it's a learning as you go kind of concept, you guys. And of course, I'll be there to, to run alongside of you to hold the handlebars just in case you start to, to waver a little bit. But you're going to get it and you're going to get it very quickly. And we're going to get into searching codes very quickly. All right. And so that's the difference in this course. And that's why I've dropped the price on it. It is very affordable. It is something you can do. I essentially, um, when I looked at the calculation, it comes down to for 16 hours of, of study a month. That's about four dollars and 68 cents an hour. You're not going to find anybody else on the Internet doing something this like this, the level that we're talking about for for cheaper, okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because, A, we're not doing modules anymore, and B, the economy is just so bad for everybody that I want to make sure that anybody that wants to do this, it's affordable. But it's also, at the same time, helping me with expenses because um, that's essentially what this school does. Um, it gives me a platform to do my passion, but also, um, like Paul the tent maker, be able to pay for my expenses and feed myself and things like that. I think it's a fair exchange, you guys, if you really look at it. I'm going to put my my 110% into it. I'll be available to you, um, you know, through the platforms that we're using. There'll be other instructors that are going to help me with this. Scott is one of those. My, my brother Jacob, the rabbi, um, is going to help, who is a Sephardic believer in Yeshua. And he is fluent in Hebrew, so he's going to bring a lot to the table. He's a big asset for this, this program. We're going to be learning some stuff together, and it's solid, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, if you're interested, please look at the a link down below. Go there, the uh, decodesearcheroutlook.com. Email me and let me know that you're interested, and let's talk on the phone. And by the way, that those that have already emailed me, check your emails. I've been playing this long distance ping pong game with many of you that have emailed me already. You haven't checked your email. I responded immediately and I'm waiting for you to get back with me so we can talk on the phone and I can get you into the group so we can start. I would like to start this in the next couple of weeks, you guys. OK, I got people in idle uh, in the discord pro, uh, platform that I've, I've got. Um, that are waiting for the rest of you to join the class. We want to get a full roster before we start. And if we need to start another class, we'll do that. We'll, we'll certainly make sure everybody has room, okay? So keep that in mind. If you've already emailed me and said you're interested, check your emails. I've, I've responded to every single one, and I've got like five that has not responded back. I want to talk to you on the phone, get to know you a little bit, and see where you are in your walk and, and how serious you are before before we just put you in there, right? I'm, I can't just put anybody in there that, that, that messages me without talking with them, okay? And I think that's fair. So um, I think that's all I got for you guys. Please, if you are interested, you can afford this. 
It's like $75 a month. Okay. And that's, that's a bargain. $4 and 68 cents an hour. I think that's a good deal, you guys. And I'm going to, like I said, put 110% in it and teach you everything that I know. And then some, we're going to be learning some things together. So uh, be sure to see the next video that I put out, um, whether that be a premiere or video, it's also going to bless you. It's from Chuck Missler and it's one of the great ones. All right. Shalom to you. May Yah bless you and keep you. Uh, we'll see you in the next video.